uh, Laplanck length. This is 10 to the minus uh, 32 centimeters. Uh, it's very, very, very small. You can't get much smaller than that. It would still be in a realm that anybody knows anything about. Empty space contains structure and energy and information. This is the spin network proposed by Roger Penrose. It's one of the models of space. There are a lot of models. Mark Cummings says it isn't the quantum vacuum. It's the quantum plenum. It's an abundance. He wrote a beautiful paper that's published in the Nicene Journal. The plenum is an absolute fullness. It's the real source of energy for everything, from hydrogen bombs to cooking your breakfast. The molecular geometry induces a flux. This geometry induces a flux in the plenum into our living structure. It's an absolutely, infinitely coherent field of luminosity. I, uh, I went to a, the Sutherland Cranial College in London to give a seminar, a workshop. And the head of the college invited me to his practice. He asked me to hold the, the feet of his client while he held their occiput. And I did that. And things happened. And after about the third client that he worked on, I said, Jeremy, what are you doing? And he said, well, actually, the less I do, the better the results. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought that was ridiculous because cranial osteopaths <coughs> Sutherland College, they're the most educated physicians in the world. They go to medical school, then they go to osteopathic college and learn osteopathic manipulation, and then they go to cranial college for two or three years. They know a lot of stuff. You're doing nothing? I don't understand that. Although now I think I do understand. When I pinned him down, he said, well, actually what I'm doing is I'm locating places in the body that aren't connected to the coherent background. I allow coherent energy to come in and fill those spaces. So his vast education, I think, is knowledge of the anatomy of the body and how to get energy from the environment into those places. And by coherent, what that means is there's a tremendous amount of energy present. But for every force going this way, there's another one going that way. And all of it cancels. It looks like nothing is happening. It looks like nothing is happening right here, but there's a tremendous amount of light in this room. If we could see it, we would be horrified. So that's what coherence means. Space is efflorescing with vacuum photons. How about that? In, it's, this is the embedding space for electromagnetism. Electromagnetism arises from these phenomena. It's the source of the inner light of the spiritual traditions. And we're luminous. We're radiant. The Dirac C, ether, quantum vacuum, quantum planet, viewed at the small scale. It looks like a sea. It looks like an ocean. It looks like nothing is happening. But lots of things are happening. What happens is positrons, you know, electrons, boil off and they immediately, immediately annihilate each other in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Poof! So lots going on, but no net result. And all you have to do is imbalance the coherence and the energy will pour out. Energy and information will pour out. I recommended Dirac, I recommend Dirac's Nobel Lecture. Uh, you might have to read it three times. I did. I finally got it. it. Took me a while. But what in fact what I like to do, I like to read the Nobel lectures and even more the presentation speeches where a member of the Nobel committee 
explains in a down-to-earth way why the prize was awarded to this person. And I, I need that simple explanation. These concepts are remarkable, but they're supported and explained by quantum physics, the morphic field. So I'm summarizing these ideas. And we begin with uh, Milo Wolf, who has a very popular website, um, quantummatter.com. He has a wave theory of matter. Physicists and philosophers look at this website very carefully. And he's written an article on the origin of the mysterious instantaneous transmission of events in science. And there are lots of instantaneous things. The gravitational force, the magnetic force, the inertial force, the einstein podolsky rosen effect, prayer and distant healing. I think that when you go to pray for somebody who's a thousand miles away, as soon as you intend to do that, the pilot wave is received by them. And then you do whatever you do, and then the healing field arrives. He wrote a book, Schroeder, Schrodinger's Universe. He thinks that the electron is a standing wave produced by the interaction of waves coming in and going out. The waves coming in are coming in from every electron in the universe. This is, uh, this is the way for quantum physicists talk. This is entanglement. This is how it works. And here are the in waves, mesmerizing. These are the in waves coming in, and these are the out waves. And together, they produce standing waves, spherical, spherical standing waves in and out. This is also a standing wave. <laughs> That's funny. That has to be funny. The nominal, nominal location of the particle is the wave center. But it has a presence everywhere in space because the forces extend throughout the universe. Dwayne Elgin has written some very interesting books about uh, the living cosmos. He's got some YouTube uh, interviews that are very interesting. The entire cosmos blinks in and out of existence. A giant pulsing wave of manifestation spreads across the universe. All objects from galaxies to people are constantly reformed. So your patient is constantly reforming anyway. So if you can insert your wisdom into that little space between the formative field and their structures, magic happens. And what is a good way to do that? Well, I think light is a pretty good idea. One of the things that uh, Dwayne Elton points out is that on the scale of things, from very, very, very tiny things to very, very large things in the universe, we are giants. We're not as close <coughs> to the end of the spectrum as we might think. Really tiny things to really big things, we're kind of in the middle. We are gigantic. Scalar waves. I already told you about that. These are Milo Wolf's electron standing waves that extend throughout space. This is another model. You saw the Roger Penrose model. This is his model. It's listed as one of the top philosophy websites on the internet. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, views per week in the top 20 of, of Google's academic search terms. And he says, for those who are religious and spiritual, well, if you prefer, you can consider space as God. Brahman, Tao, spirit, energy. What is certain is that discrete and separate particles do not exist. We are all connected to this one thing that exists, which is vibrating and oscillating. There's a, uh, an interesting book by, uh, edited by 
Stephen Hawking. It's called The Dreams That Stuff Is Made Of. And it's quotes from the leading cause, um, quantum physicists saying that all matter, we dream it up. No consciousness, no matter. No consciousness, no patience. No, no work. No work. Yeah. Every electron in the universe and every object made from electrons depends for its existence on the standing waves coming in from all over the place in the outwaves or not. Our bodies are made of matter that is continuously produced by standing waves. Every event in our bodies, including every thought, creates information that's radiated into the surrounding field. And every event anywhere, including every thought, creates information that's radiated into us. We know everything. Somebody asked about black holes. The cosmologists, this is kind of mind-blowing, the, the cosmologists think that black holes are the hard drives of the universe. Okay. In other words, the black holes store vast amounts of information. Is that better? You hear me better? Yeah. So how does consciousness fit into this picture? Ask anybody and they'll tell you where's your mind? It's up here. Where's your memory? It's up here. Where's consciousness? It's in my brain. Where do you think? In my brain. I'll tell you that. What if all of these ideas are totally wrong? This is what Sheldrake has dramatically, in, in a scholarly fashion, brought into question, as have many others. These Nobel Prize winners in physics were convinced that quantum processes are at the interface between consciousness and matter. Nobel winners. Other leading scholars have been developing this alternative model of consciousness in which the properties of space play a key role. Beltheim says consciousness is the evolving intelligence of the universe. Universal consciousness is the sum total of all knowledge and accumulated intelligence. And until recently, leading philosophers generally agreed that memory and consciousness are not in the brain. There was a payment about this. It's described in Rupert Sheldrake's recent book, Science Set Free, in which Sheldrake takes on and there's some good YouTube videos of him giving a talk about this. Um, he takes 10 of the things that everybody in science and the man on the street knows to be true, and he turns them very gently in a scholarly <coughs> way into questions, into open questions. They're not solved problems. So Plotinus, memories reside in the soul. Bertrand Russell, there's a kind of causation that connects things across time. Wittgenstein, memory is not stored in the brain. Carl Jung, psyche is not in the head or the brain. These are thoughtful people. Children. Memory depends on morphic resonance, a resonance across time. And he says this, I can't study your TV and determine what programs you watched last night. They're not there. And they have not left a trace. The main brain may be like this, a receiver that tunes into the memory channel, but the show is not stored there. You are liquid crystals. What does that mean? Most of the molecules in the body are helical, and they're arrayed as liquid crystals. Look at the cross-section of muscle. Look at that. That is a crystal. Actin and myosin molecules in a crystalline array. 
DNA has to be packed into a crystal. There are something like six feet of DNA in every cell in your body. And to get them in there, they have to be really packed tightly together. The connective tissue makes up most of your body structure. It's a liquid crystal. Cell membranes, liquid crystals, made of phospholipids. Ginsburg wrote five books on the helical structure of space. He says, the universe has a spiral brain to it. A spiral brain. It has a brain to it. The space molecules in the heart, they're all spirals. The heart. Well, this is a uh, sculpture that shows uh, the outline of a man <coughs> encased in the helical structure. The artist knows. This is the cosmic corkscrew. Light spirals through space. It doesn't come in a straight line. This is the corneal stroma. The thick, tough layer right under the corneal epithelium. With the endothelium on the inside. And light spirals through that, and it has a plywood-like structure. You know how you make plywood? Take a very thin sheet of plywood with the grain running this way, and another sheet with the grain running this way, and so on. With the grains <coughs> offset, you glue them together, creates a very strong structure. It's kind of obvious that this structure is designed to allow light to spiral move through it. It's a, a cholesteric liquid crystal. It has an optical axis and it has a helical axis. I found a paper by Trostad that says there's a progressive shift in the orientation of the fibers in the stroma from the outer to the inner layer. The shift is clockwise. In amphibia and other organisms that he studied, both eyes have the same spiral brain. They're both uh, clockwise. That creates an interesting developmental problem. Because usually when things are on two sides of the body, they're asymmetric. What happened here? How did that happen? Well, it turns out that um, there's a fellow at Tufts University, Levin, the Levin lab. They have been studying the electrical fields involved in morphogenesis. And they have found that the fields for the two eyes are the same. They're not asymmetrical. Well, that's how the structure gets formed. And the shift is different from these different animals, ducks, frogs, carps, turtles, which may have to do with the kind of environment that they live in. Uh, there has to be impedance matching or, or resistance matching. If you're looking in water, if you're underwater, if you're in fish, you have to have a different eye structure than if you're a duck or a turtle. <laughs> so the human body is made of helices. And let's take a clo close look at the uh, extracellular matrix. The uh, fabric inside the body. This is uh, a famous hand surgeon in Bordeaux, France, Jean-Claude Bomberteau. Um, I've met him three times. He uh, gave me permission to use his illustration for which I am very grateful, as you will see. And he has made DVDs. He has done endoscopy, high-definition video, under the skin during surgery. He's made a video called Strolling Under the Skin. It's beautiful. And here's his camera, and here's his fiber optic uh, 
fiber optic system with a light at the end. And with this technology, you can achieve levels of detail on the inside fabric of the body never before achieved. This is fantastic. So this is the skin surface. It's woven into a framework of polyhedral structures, like sacred geometry. There it is again. Then you go under the surface. Under the surface, you find polyhedral micro vacuoles enclosed by collagen fibers. They contain water and glycosaminoglycan polymers. They break open during surgery uh, and they look wet because of the hydrated gel. These dew drops that you can see in the microscope are from the destruction of the structure during observation. The underlying network, smaller fibers within larger ones throughout the body. What I'm saying is that this is ideally suited to resonate with the fabric of space. The skin surface and the underlying matrix form a tensegrity structure. It absorbs the pressures of gravity and withstands stretching. Are you familiar with tensegrity? Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about it some more tomorrow. The cells fit into these spaces perfectly. The arrangement allows for an infinite variety of movements. So this is a cell stuck into these spaces. This is music to me. This is poetry. From the DNA helix to the cytoskeleton, including the links to the integrins that go across the surface of the cell, neighboring cells, everything is in continuity. Everything is connected. Everything moves to fit, and everything moves and always comes back. That's a fantastic summary of this man's work, of what it looks like in there. Everything moves and everything comes back. And this is the living matrix, which is in the title of my presentation. This is the recognition that there is a continuous system throughout the body. The, the integrins cross the cell surface and connect with the, connect the extracellular matrix with the cytoskeleton, which joins the nuclear envelope and the nuclear matrix. So the human body is a matrix within a matrix, within a matrix, within a matrix, within a matrix, a larger matrix of energy fields, quantum fields. Skin surface, connective tissue under the skin. This is a structure that forms around the nucleus right before cell division. Polyhedron. If you're interested in tensegrity, here is a wonderful article. It's the cover. Uh, story from January 1998, Scientific American, The Architecture of Life, A Universal Set of Building Rules Seems to Guide the Design of Organic Structures from Simple Carbon Compounds to Complex Cells and Tissues. Life, architecture, cells grow with tensegrity. And here you see the cell surface and its tensegrous structure. What I'm saying is that these geometric patterns can resonate with the fabric of space. More polygons. Roger Penrose. Sacred geometry. We call it sacred geometry. We find this symbol on sacred buildings in every culture in the world, down through the ages. Why is this structure there? Because it's been recognized to have magical properties. And why does it have magical properties? Because it resonates with the fabric, the energetic fabric of the universe. So I don't call it sacred geometry if I'm in a lecturing in a medical school. You have to watch yourself when you lecture in a medical <laughs> school. So I call it the geometry of the quantum vacuum. Vacuum geometry. What are these guys doing? These are Tibetan monks making a sand painting. 
Are they trying to make a painting? When they get done, they wipe it all away and start over again. They are doing it because of how it affects their consciousness. They are making sacred geometry because it feels good. The thing with the sand is tapping. Energy spirals through our bodies in the field of the heart is a vortex. This is the cover to the Spanish edition of my book, Energy Medicine. The artist made this incredible diagram. Energy spirals through the body. He shows it here. The heart is a vortex. Daniel Ford is his name. Hello. Good job. Light and electricity swirl through the heart muscles. With every heartbeat. There's a resonance between the double helical heart and DNA. The double helical heart. This is the helical heart. This was a discovery by a Spanish cardiologist by the name of Torrent Guasp, G-U-A-S-P. And you can see him on the web dissecting a heart, a cow heart. And with a simple blunt dissection, you boil it first to loosen up the connective tissue. With a simple blunt dissection, you discover that the ventricle unrolls into a single band. He calls it the myocardial band with a valve on each end. And it folds up as a double helix. Even though it's much larger than the DNA, it can resonate with the DNA. It can go by octave to much smaller structures. The helical heart. And here it is. And the single band and how it coils up. Light spirals through your tissues and from your hands. Tomorrow is going to be about generating therapeutic light in the hands. This is a, the magnetic spiral that comes from your hands. And light comes from your hands. Um, Fritz Pop and his colleagues measured it, and some of his other colleagues show that when you extend the hand, more light comes out. Just that simple bit of doing that. So we'll do some of that tomorrow. I have thought for a long time that light activates stem cells. I have thought that a lot of hands-on body work is effective because the light from the hands stimulates the stem cells. And now, putting these pieces together, it looks like that might be correct. Spirals are everywhere in nature, and everything is spiraling and spinning. Everything is spinning. This is uh, Dwayne Elgin's book, The Living Universe. The more we're in touch with the universe we come from, the more we will be able to heal ourselves, and at the same time, heal our opponents. We are an integral part of the living and intelligent universe. Oh, okay. Is it time for me to stop? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Does circular polarization fall into this any place? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the living matrix, and this is the energy information system in the body. And the little red things are electrons zipping around inside the matrix. And this is a communication system. When you have a trauma, this is a system that is disturbed. 
But even deeper than that, I think the spins are disturbing. Your patient's living matrix is the part of their body that is traumatized. It's also an antenna that broadcasts the details to you. If you pay attention, you will hear the details. <coughs> Much of the body is liquid crystalline material, and, and the body, these crystals are organized vertically. For example, this is the triple helix of collagen. Most of the collagen runs up and down in the body. Some of it goes at an angle to the vertical. There's something special about verticality. We are evolving towards verticality. Why is that? What is the drive in nature to become vertical? There's something else that goes on. So here's collagen running up and down in the connective tissue. Uh, muscles. The bulk of the body is muscle. Helical molecules organized in crystals. They are liquid crystals. 99% of the molecules in your body are water molecules. Something like 70% by weight, but if you count the water molecules and compare them with the other molecules, 99% of the molecules in your body are water. If that percentage changes, you're in trouble. <laughs> Most of these water molecules are at interfaces at the surfaces of other molecules, the surfaces of cells <coughs> and tissues. Water in the body is another liquid crystal with the axes oriented vertically. The spacing of the amino acids along the collagen molecule, and this was determined a long time ago by a uh, Dutch uh, uh, biochemist using uh, infrared spectroscopy. The spacing of the amino acids is just right to bind water molecules, right next to the structure. The molecules are spinning. They're spinning coherently. They're spinning together. This arrangement, this is why living matter is so incredibly sensitive the fields in the environment. Fields change the spin of the water molecule. <coughs> Collagen triple helix. This is the protein, and this is the hydration layer, the hydration shell. This is from Claude Swanson's work and the work of the Soviets that he has interacted with. The steadily spinning object generates a steady right-handed torsion field in one direction and a left-handed torsion field in the other direction along the axis of spin. Torsion fields. Notice that they're running up and down. This has implications for how we move in the gravitational field. And conversely, torsion fields in the environment will cause the object to spin. And this is true of many things, but what we've got the most of is water. Electromagnetic fields cause spinning water molecules to precess. This is known as Larmor precession, named after the Irish mathematician and physicist who discovered it. This is what makes us so extremely sensitive. Protons and electrons spin have to be a little cautious here because spin is a quantum phenomenon. And when we think of spin, we think of things spinning. There might not be things spinning. It's, it's, a, it's a quantum property that has to be there to make the equations balance. I'm not sure if anything is really spinning. So that's a little caveat. But you can, for simplicity or to understand it, you can compare it to a spinning uh, top in the absence of an external field. There's a certain spin axis that the field is applied. The spin axis tilts, and the particle sweeps out a conical surface. And this frequency is known as the Larmor frequency. 
named after so Sir Joseph. So here's an oscillating field. And as the field oscillates, the tilt changes. This is the basis for electron spin resonance, proton or nuclear magnetic resonance, magnetic resonance imaging, the MRI. Spin acts as the source of the torsion field, just as electric charge and mass produce electromagnetic and gravitational fields. Wonderful book. Easy to read, very, very instructive. Sync by Stephen Strogatz. How order emerges from chaos in the universe, nature, and daily life. Spin is contagious. This one a book award. You see on the front cover fireflies. Those fireflies are there because of a husband-wife team of biologists that I met at Woods Hole, the Bucks, and they went to Formosa and they studied trees that fill with fireflies at night and they flash synchronously. Millions of fireflies flashing synchronously. How do they do that? How do they do that? Well, the Bucks gathered some fireflies and took them to their hotel room. And at night, they let the fireflies out in their hotel room, and a firefly flashed, and another one flashed, and pretty soon they were all flashing. We don't know how they synchronize, but they do. Very precisely. It's like, uh, how do the doves fly in formation? Amazing. If there are a trillion miles of collagen, there are probably a trillion miles of collagen in your body. There must be about a zillion miles of precisely aligned spinning water molecules. Lots and lots and lots of them. When the energy level in these crystals reaches a certain point, the molecules begin to vibrate coherently and they emit coherent light like a laser beam. This is radiance. This was uh, described by Herbert Froelich, a one of the uh, leading lights in physics. They had uh, the, the major theory of uh, superconduction, and he just he, he realized that looking at these systems they would become coherent and they would generate coherent light. <coughs> this isn't very well known. Um, my biologist colleagues don't like quantum physics. They would like it to go away. They would rather not know about it. It's work. You've got to learn some new things. Sorry, but that's what you have to do. I like it. I have a theory, if technology can do it, biology has already perfected it. <laughs> biology has experimented with every physical law in the universe, tinkered with it, and capitalized on it, and used it to its advantage. We have no idea how many tricks our bodies use to function so as well as they do. A single water molecule can store information a single water molecule can decohere. It can go out of coherence. And this is described in the modern electronics literature where they're using this, this phenomenon of coherence and decoherence to make ultra-fast computers. And a single water molecule can have a memory and can lose it. So when you do your work with light, one of the possibilities, and this is a hypothesis, is that you organize the spins of the water molecules on the different structures so that they can communicate with each other. And I believe that communication is a basis for normal physiology, normal communication, normal functioning. Wan Ho in England 
has written, if you're interested um, in this stuff, join her society, the Institute for Science and Society. You will get her magazine, which is incredible. She has an incredible magazine called Science in Society. She calls it the only radical science magazine on earth. It's radical. And it deals with two things. She deals with Monsanto oh. and genetically modified foods. She is hard on them. And she does um, very sophisticated biophysics. And as I mentioned this morning at the little gathering, we were talking about the future of the organization. She puts on conferences that are science, art, and music. And they're wonderful. I went to one this spring in London. And she's figured out this. Energy and information input into any of the body systems can be readily delocalized over all the systems. Conversely, energy and information from all systems can be concentrated into any single system. Energy coupling in living systems is symmetrical, which is why we can have energy at will whenever and wherever required. So this means we can take in. I met a, uh, a Qigong practitioner. He said, before I get a, an exam at the university, I store up energy so that I will be really awake and alert for the exam. You can do that. All you have to do is think it, and it'll work. You can prepare yourself for a strenuous event in advance by taking in energy and spreading it through your systems. And then you can have it, if it's got to come out, the pencil tip, it'll come out. So this is the spacing of water molecules along the collagen. And here are the water molecules spinning. And Here's the essential story I put together. This is, this is the new story. There is a continuous communication in both directions, from the living system through water to space, and from space through water to the living system. So water is the key to the morphic resonance. It's the key to tapping into the in energy and information that is everywhere around us. Think about it. See if this makes sense to you. The problem has been that the biochemists have thought that water is just the matrix, the molecules float around it. Water is a lot more than that. Hypothesis, normal physiology and health are downstream from quantum coherence in the water systems. Light therapy, I predict, will eventually be shown to affect quantum coherence in the water systems. And the arrows go in both directions. We're coupling the hologram of the body to the hologram of space, and the hologram of space to the hologram of the body. This is an ancient principle that goes back to the Vedas. So there, there are wise people who knew about this a long time ago. Nature's Code. This is amazing. I came across this article, Nature's Code, by Vanessa Hill and Peter Rollins. I don't understand this article at all, but I can tell you. We propose that the mathematical structures related to the vacuum structure of evolution talk. Uh, the fermion vacuum spin one half, two double heads, one headed. This is what <laughs> This sprays my brain. 64 elements of Dirac algebra, four parameters, mass, space, time, charge. The unification of physics and biology. Look at these sacred geometries. What is being reset when you reset the system, the universal reset? Healthy physiology and biochemistry are downstream from coherence. The matrix is the medium, 
electrons and quantum coherence are the messages. And this is a, this is a representation of a, an informational regulatory network in the body. And if he got interested in the book, they would take it away. So one day they brought him a cosmology book. He went crazy. He had to pretend it wasn't interesting. And he memorized it when no one was looking. And he sat in prison for a long time. And he thought about it. And he got ideas that were incredible. And when he finally got out of prison, he did research that showed that some of his ideas were true. And they are truly astounding ideas. A lot of it was about time. Time does not propagate, for example, like electromagnetic.